common denominator between religious pursuit and meditation is this loss of the self, you know, that ego with the name that has for in the social security. The question is, when you go to church or to your synagogue, how aware are you of being the head of the Honda dealership while you're in church? Or looking at other people's dresses or what your name is, what your last name is. Nothing wrong with any of that, but I can tell you very honestly, Contact with the God Force cannot begin for as long as you're very aware of this ah. So, you know, in Iran, we have people go to Mecca and they take 15 people with them and they lodge themselves in the Sheraton. And when they come back, people give them loads of roses. What for? Like, you're clapping for me because I've gone to visit God. What for? It's a very private thing. So, if you can align your religious practice to simply fade the eye, in other words, you're looking at Christ's statue and you just melt into the light. I was at this one retreat, and on the corner of my eye, I saw this woman go up to Holy Mary's statue, and she held Mary's feet. It was quite a sight to see because this woman went into ecstatic prayer while in the presence of that statue. I immediately got she was in meditative places. You should know there is a kind of samadhi, which is the highest state of meditation. There's a kind of samadhi that you can achieve through a prayer, the ecstasy of prayer. There are several different types of yogis, so you can find which category you belong. The first one is called the jhana yogi. I'm one of those. Jhana yogi means you're very smart and you use your intellect to wrap your intellect around the idea of what is God, who is God, the relationship between quantum physics and the God force. So the jhana yogi has a sharp mind. And they're trying to understand the Lord through the angle of the mind. So, you know, they study the Bhagavad Gita, quantum physics, child psychology, all. The next kind of person is called the Bhakti Yogi. Bhakti Yogis have a hard mystic. They're just very heartful people. And they say heartfelt prayers. And they're very, very easy with prayer and saying grace. So I'll admit to you, when I got on this path, one of my big issues was saying grace. Because I was more scientific for you. So when everybody held hands at dinner time, I was the one that had to push myself. It's not because I didn't believe in God. For me, this business of leaning into worship came last. So I knew I was not a bhakti yogi. Which one of you has like a huge heart and you have a really easy time praying for hours? Good. So you see, you're that kind of a yogi. Therefore, for me to introduce to you 166 books about quantum physics and the Vedas, you're going to have an easier time finding a symbol of God and simply going into prayer. And it is just that effect. Actually, more effective because for us, we we essentially have to be sent down to the heart. So I was struck by a thunderbolt and I descended to the heart. So that's the Bhakti Yogi. And there are some of you who are very active and you have a tough time sitting down. But you're such authentic seekers that you want to help the Guru and you want to help the Islam. So you're called karma Let's see if we have some of those. You're the type who picks up the mop and shines the floor of Ashtanga, Sri Ashtanga, and that's your way of worship. So which one of you is a karma You will not for the guru, for the organization, and for people. A karma yogi is actually 
have a tamer, a more tame group of clients. Because typically when a very well-known guru puts on a retreat, uh, a lot of the hookta and the attention is on he or she on the mat. What people don't know is that a group of people do days and days of hard work so that the yogi can sit and have his retreat. So when I go to the Middle East, there are about 20 people who work for you know day and night for three days just to get the event together. We need lodging, we need transportation. My country has to be very careful security wise because they raid places like this. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. The karma yogis are very rarely seen, which means that they have pain eaters. Anyway, figure out which one fits your nature most. You have a big, big heart and have a very easy time in prayer and worship. Are you the active type? Mahatma Gandhi was a karma yogi. He rolled up his sleeves and got the independence of India. He was that kind of yogi. Today I want to talk to you about meditation because there's a lot of misunderstanding about meditation. Number one, it's not officially an organized religion, but for those of you who go deep, and you follow your breath down to your deepest essence, you'll find very quickly that the real contact with the Lord is in your own quiet space. So if you don't make quietude available to yourself, it's very difficult to be religious in the sense of having God come. Patanjali, one of the founders of Raja Yoga, says, look, without a still mind, forget the notion of making contact with natural forces, because your mind is interfering. Last night, we talked about the kind of mind that constantly superimposes past memories on the present. You need to practice looking at the Pacific Ocean and having no ideas, just seeing the Pacific, without any idea. People have a tough time, like you go fishing and you just watch your cork bob up and down. And that's all for what you're looking for. There's no memory, no past, no life story, none of that. For as long as your life story is very vivid in your mind, I will say with a lot of love that you're still sick. Why do I say that? Because our life stories are full of interpretation. This is why you can never ask uh, three people's opinion about a particular person and get the identical story. Because it's all the superimposing of personal ideas. The enlightened person is like this. They're simply with the there's no ideas in the superpowers. Coming back to meditation. Meditation is keeping an eye on your own inner landscape. So if you look at a video camera like this, in meditation, your consciousness turns into a camcorder and your consciousness zooms in on the inside. So, for example, you notice when you're jealous. You notice when you're hungry. You notice when you're restless. You notice your thoughts. You notice your physical sensations. In a kind of meditation which some of you know is called vipassana, in Buddhist meditation actually, uh, the camera lens is on mindfulness. So you notice the roar of the motorcycle, your emotions the rhythm of your breath. Uh, the Buddha said, if you can become intensely mindful of everything, you'll go into nirvana, which is really the same word as samadhi. If you don't know the history of this, how did yoga go to the far east and become Buddhism? You 
may know this. Um, the Buddha being a prince basically made his way on foot from southern India to Sri Lanka. In those days, there was a stretch of land connecting Sri Lanka and India. When the Buddha went to Sri Lanka, that's where he kind of veered off and he created his own wonderful science of Buddhism. In, in my case, I'm teaching Kriya Yoga, and Kriya Babaji also went to Sri Lanka, but then the meditation come, coming from Babaji is slightly different from the Buddha's. So they both lead to the same place. If the Buddha's leads to Nirvana, which means the merger of the self in the one pulse of the God flows in space. Last night I mentioned that the ancient scriptures describe the Lord as a, 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 it's a heartbeat full of consciousness. So in the moment of you Catholic completely merging in that pulse, is called Nirvana in Buddhism and Samadhi in the Indian style. What's the difference between these two styles of meditation? Quite a bit, although they lead to the same place. In, in Vipassana Buddhist meditation, you are so incredibly mindful that the level of your mindfulness puts you intensely in awe. It's like you go to Wyoming, sit by a river, and you get so intensely present that you're hearing the trickles of the water coming off. That would be Vipassana. What would you do in Kriya Yoga meditation? <clears throat> in Kriya Yoga meditation, you become concentrated. So there's a difference between concentration and mindfulness. I'm going to act it out as a natural. Here's my Everything. That's my thoughts. Here's Kriya Yoga. One laser. So when I ask you to breathe up your spine, you're a laser. But if you're listening to a river in Wyoming, you're wider. Interestingly enough, both techniques open up to the other. How? Um, I had a cousin who was walking with me in springtime. We were close to a river with a lot of apple blossoms, and the river was there. The apple blossoms were there, and then it started to pay. So my cousin said, oh, this is so overwhelming. And I said, I don't. He said, well, there's the river, there's the apple blossoms, and there's hail. What do I focus on? And I said to him, I said, come to the point between your nostrils, and just follow the breath. And he started doing that. Right? And as he did that, he went into Vipassana. In other words, by following the breath, he became very mindful of the air, the blossoms, and without any strain. The other approach would be to become so focused on the rush of the river that you fly into this. So let me wrap this up. If you go to the Buddha beach and you become extremely mindful of the little baby girl running on the sand and the dawn and the surfer, all of it together, what would happen is you lose the name Doret. The minute you lose Doret, you're in bliss. So that's achieving bliss through mindfulness. Let's take Kriya Yoga. In Kriya Yoga, let's say you grow orchids and you become very focused on your orchid to the point where the perfume is making you drunk and you're, even, you're so focused that you're even seeing sap flow through the veins of the flower plant. That would also take you to this because again, you lose the red. So, whether it's a church, the synagogue or the mosque. Your religion should be based on the common denominator. 
can I lose myself in Mecca, in the valley, Tel Aviv, does it make I'm teaching you the common denominator. Pablo Picasso is on his feet nine hours a day in his paintings. How come he doesn't feel there's no problem? He's lost. When I'm holding a pen, I get lost. Three hours. I actually look handsome. My wife says you look handsome when you write. You know why? What happens when you, if you have one activity, it makes you get lost. You look gorgeous. You start to look cool. The getting the lost, the losing of the social security level, and your intellectual mind will make you feel lost. I can pick people off from a mile if they look gorgeous. It's called Dharma. Dharma is the activity. It gets you into the flow and you lose Coming back to meditation. When you meditate, your intention is to focus a camera, ego, sensations, thoughts, emotions, and after a while, you realize that everything is impermanent. In meditation, you discover that none of your thoughts last for more than a few seconds. You realize that your emotions are different between 10, 15, and 10, 20. And then you realize that every year and a half, every cell in your body has been renewed. So now we're in real trouble because your thoughts are non lasting, your emotions are non lasting, your body doesn't last. So what's left of you? And there, yoga says the only thing permanent is the witness. In Farsi we say Shah. What we say is there's a part of your mind that's just a witness. Like a real challenge. Your mind can actually split in two. One part of it is babbling away. The other part is very centered, noble, and wise. Just look. The part that just looks is a real part. It exists. And I can give you the acid test right now. I'll have you look down on the door, I'll count to three, and on the number three, I'll have you wait intensely for the next thought. How many people last night had no thought as you were waiting? Okay. Most people would. Why is it that your thoughts disappear? Very simple. Your mind can be split into one part of it is extremely wise, has all the answers, and has a big organized center mind. The other part of your mind uh, shrinks down and starts to believe thoughts. It's a very interesting thing that the Indian Vedas say. The Vedas say that the Lord, being the creator of the universe, can actually shrink down and get entangled in her own creation. What a strange thing to say. And the Vedas make no bones about this. They say, somebody as grand as the Lord can create thoughts and then shrink down and get entangled in her own thoughts. The Vedic philosophy is, when you folks are born, after a few weeks, Forget that you are the Lord. Why is that? After a while, the baby starts to identify with the passing thoughts. As long as the baby is either not having thoughts or not identifying, they're in complete touch with the creative forces. So let's bring you to this moment. If you're having thoughts right now but not believing them, you're already a very enlightened person. All you have to do is not get invested in the meaning of the thoughts. The fact that you're having thoughts is irrelevant. You could be down there in data point, looking out at the pier, thoughts are marching in front of your eyes. You're not invested. This will happen to you. I went to Fairfield, Iowa for two years, seven hours of meditation. What happened to me was the mind became Teflon. The thought
thoughts will stick. So I would look at jealousy like that. I could see the jealousy, but I would be like three yards away. The jealousy would come. I spoke to Satya Sai Baba, one of the grand masters. He said, never think that us grand gurus don't think. We think that we're so separate from the thought, there's no identification. So I want you to make friends with your thoughts. And here's the explanation coming from the Vedantas. When I say Vedantas, I mean the entire collection of spiritual books from ancient uh, the Vedanta say when you're in the gap between two thoughts, you're literally at the level of the Lord. The minute you believe one of the thoughts, you shrink down. So if you're looking at thought, not identified, what's the issue? Or if you're waiting for the next thought and not having a thought, you're at a very good place. That place is called pure consciousness. If you cooperate with me and do the meditation I send, I'm going to send you a link to your email. It has a track one, track. You do track one in the morning, track two. If you continue that for even three months, you see that the gap between your thoughts is growing. That gap between two thoughts is called pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is what Einstein called the unified field. It is a field of energy that is completely organized. It's full of wisdom. There's no negative emotions attached to it. If pure consciousness can look at your life story, like when you were eight, it will look at that but it won't invest in A lot of people get the notion that detachment of the kind I just described is some sort of depression or, or lack of zest for life. It's not that. Actually, when you stop going up and down this roller coaster, you'll be much more joyful. Even falling in love, you know, if you fall in love too hard, you become ill. It's great to fall in love, but don't get sick over it. A yogi will never kill himself if the fiancé says, no, I don't want you. Because there's a connection with the core of life. So a yogi can fall terribly in love, but if he hears a no, he's not going to jump off of it. Because there's an intense amount of self-love, which is different from conceit. Conceit comes from ego feeling so fragile that it needs to bolster itself. Self-love, which we'll talk about in the next session, self-love is realizing the presence of the God force in your body. The greatest self-confidence is for you to make contact with an energy inside your own bed, which is the presence of it. This is what I can do for you. And many of you before tomorrow you will feel the same. It is an actual move of Holy Spirit in your life. An actual move. By the end of this session, if you look around, two people will be going like this. What is this? And that's the spirit test. For why do you doubt you think I must be putting on a show? Why am I sweating? But you won't be able to stop. Don't try to stop. You'll give you a big head. Coming back to the if you can establish a routine in your life, it will really help your marriage. Like, can you get up earlier in the morning as the sun is coming up? When the sun is coming up, the earth is being bombarded with a huge amount of electromagnetism. What is the link between electromagnetism and the God? Big link. What I want to 
I tell you is that there is an unproven link between electromagnetism and the strong presence of God. If you go to a very salty desert like the Utah Flats, if you go to places on Earth that have high amounts of electromagnetism, you will be sucked into deep meditation. There's a place in my country where an entire sea has disappeared into a desert. Okay. If you stand in the middle of that desert, even non meditating you hear It's very loud. And if you meditate there, you'll just be pulled into a vortex. So, why get up early in the morning? If you have the discipline, please do your meditation as the sun is coming up. Because there's a, you know, the planets have a big pull on each other. And when the sun is coming up, your beautiful town is just being showered with that kind of energy. The other ideal time is right before the sun goes down. With the modern life, you may not be able to do that. So if you can, you can. Once you receive my meditation CD, leave track two for the evenings. It will change the entire quality of your perception.